Hello and welcome to For the Hamlet. I'm Ben and I am uh, joined as always by Hugo. Good afternoon. I'm also joined by Danny Mills. Good afternoon, guys. And uh, this week's guest, I'm very happy to say, is a uh, Dulwich Hamlet midfielder, winger. Let's go with both, shall we? Lionel Lanes. <laughs> How are you doing, guys? Very well. How are you? How's your day? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, just been playing all day uh, after finishing work with my five-year-old. Um, and just finished literally about 10, 15 minutes ago. She would not stop. You know, she uses every little bit of time she can. So, Are you homeschooling? Uh, yes. Um, I work in a school as, as well as play football now. Um, but my fiance is, I, she's in a school as well where she does maths, English, you know, French, all, all the rest of it. So she takes over that role. Um, but she's pregnant, uh, 11 weeks to go. And she was up at four o'clock this morning. So I just thought, right, I'll take over and do it today. So, oh my God! Oh, I'm yeah. good, man. Appreciate you having yeah. to fit this in, to be honest. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's fine. No worries at all. Um, so, for those who don't know, and actually, I know like I know about patches of your career, including um, a certain goal scored at quite a big ground in Scotland, which is kind of folklore between quite a lot of us at the club. But um, can you just take us through your football career up to this point and how you ended up at uh, Dulwich Chamberlain? Um, well, yeah, uh, started off my football career um, at Derby County. Um, young boy there going through the ranks from 14 to 19 um, made a couple of appearances uh, for the first team and then you know as football goes you get released uh, which at that time you think it's the end of the world and it's not it's probably the best thing that happened to me in my career at that point um, I got let go I went to Hereford small little town um, you know sleeping giant to be honest in, in those years and uh Started playing for them. I uh, wasn't there for long because I ended up getting bought. Um, so that's when I went to Watford. I've been around the country a bit, <laughs> probably up and down a few times. Um, but been at various clubs like Brentford, Huddersfield, Shrewsbury, uh, Rotherham before I actually travelled up to um, Scotland, to Motherwell, where probably the best four years of my football career and life in general. You know, just the place, the people, the football just everything. It was, it was amazing. You know, I was, um, I was in get, I got, got engaged up there. I had my little girl up there. So, you know, I'm proud, very proud to say that she's Scottish and so is she, you know, so that's a, that's a good thing that she's got from, from being up there. Um, you know, she plays football, dual uh, citizenship, which is, which is good, you know? Um, and yeah, so it took me to uh, Mobilewell and I think I was 30 years old, got offered a contract, but it just, it was with lots of cuts and stuff. Um, and when, to be honest, it's a short career, so you've got to make as much as you can while you can. Uh, got to move to Plymouth Argyle. Um, after that, a bit of a weird couple of years. Probably the, probably the last two, three years of my career was probably the worst, if I'm being honest, in terms of football. Um, but I, tried, I, I didn't take that home with me. And, and I just got on with it. You know, I got like, never late, never disruptive, never questioned anything. Just did what I was, uh, was asked of me. Um, which led me to being released um, at 32 uh, and then basically stepping out of the professional game, which is not a problem. I've had years in the game. This is football. There's younger talent coming through. So, you know, I'm as a coach now and working in schools, uh, you know, I like to see the progression of kids, which if I had someone behind me at Dulwich, you know, Lewis White, um, Malik, you know, we had all these boys that I'm rooting for. You know, you might play my position. That's brilliant. But, you, you know, that's the next generation that you want to push through, you know, which eventually after Plymouth led me to Weymouth, you know, and then I scored a little tap in against uh, Dulwich. Um, <laughs> I think Danny was there that day. And, uh, I should yeah, have blocked and, it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was, it, it was that, that game that I actually, uh, I see the, the staff on the sideline after and shook hands and stuff. And I just, you know, whispered and I think it was, uh, I think it was juniors here. I said, well, I'm local. You know, and then uh, I heard that obviously the club were trying to get hold of me that same day while I was in the changing room, but they couldn't. Um, <laughs> and then I made contact. I made contact with Gavin Rose and Millsy saw me at a game and he's like, are you double agent here or what? Like scouting? <laughs> I was like, I'll let you know. <laughs> and then next minute I'm there on the Thursday training and, you know, and up until COVID-19, you know, Dulwich player. So. It's quite the journey, man. How is yeah. it? How is it um, like going from playing in the SPL to then playing in the Conference South? Well, it's, I mean, I mean, the SPFL was 
brilliant. Loved it. The quality of football, the grounds that you play in, the players that you play against, you know, it's a, it's a worldwide watch league as much as, not as much as the Premiership, but it is out there. You know, you see players getting moves from Scotland to different countries, to the Premiership, to the Championship. Um, so the quality was good. Um, the people that you worked with were top quality. You know, there's no, there's not, there's not any difference between the, the National South and um, the Premiership in terms of personnel. When yeah, you might have a little bit of quality, a uh, bit, a little bit of better quality. Um, but I was surprised how good, and that's just me being honest. I was surprised how good it was in the National League South, like the quality. Because when I played against, come up against Millsy's team, because I met Millsy in the May before last year because we did our B licence together. And um, when we played him for Weymouth, I was like, oh, this is going to be a long day because the way it started, the players that they had, the quality, I was like, wow, this is not, it's not just, you know, football. It's actually a good, good standard, you know, and it's something that I was enjoying being involved with. Yeah, I think, it, um, I think that's the case for a lot of players who maybe haven't like, come the other way up the leagues. So when they drop down, are all I'm massively surprised by the level and particularly now like, we, we spoke about this and um, I can't remember who we spoke about it with recently but the National League South now like a quarter of the teams are full-time and then the National League <coughs> I think all of them are full-time yeah. Um, yeah the quality now right down through the levels is is, is higher like higher than it's ever been. Uh, yeah and, and that's what you need for, for the progression up into your League Two's Ones Championship and Premiership you need that base to be able to progress players and send them on their journey you know if, if you are a football club um like Dulwich Hamlet's got great uh area to work in with players that will come um great fan base you know that is always there every week cheering you on it's a massive club in the league um probably deserves to be higher than it is but I think you know there's a process with everything that you know in, in that time as, as Millsy will know that and yourselves will know that you have to build that and when you build it, it will it will just happen naturally. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, guys, as as you know, this is uh, this is episode five of Home Disadvantage. It's our new series that um, we've been doing for a few weeks now. Grateful to Lionel for joining the chat. Um, and yeah, for for this week, uh, we decided to ask our audience um, if they had any questions they wanted to ask us on any, any of the topics that we've covered up to this point, or if they've got any questions which they've always wanted the answers to, but they've never felt comfortable to ask, or they've never been in a position to be able to ask. And um, some of them are really basic, like, but I think it will be really useful for us to answer. And um, so I've got like a few here, which we got sent on Instagram and on Twitter. Um, so I'm just going to kick us off. And it's a pretty simple one. Like I've, I've just mentioned it before when it came on air, but there's a guy who's messaged us saying, and I, I I've, this has crossed my mind before because I own a similar item that I bought. Um, he's basically asked, he's, he bought the new um, Sierra Leone kit. Uh, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's a really nice piece of kit. So he, he bought it, um, white guy who lives in Peckham, and then um, he cancelled the order because he didn't know... He basically didn't feel comfortable wearing it around the area that he lives in, which is Peckham, which is um, a predominantly historically black community. Um, and he, he doesn't feel comfortable. He mentions colonialism, um, racism in the UK. So is, wh what do you guys think? Is he okay to wear that around Peckham and like, represent essentially a country that he's not from, and in particular a country which had suffered, has suffered as a result of colonialism? Was he? Um. There's, for, for me personally, there's absolutely nothing wrong with him wearing that shirt. Absolutely nothing wrong. At the end of the day, if you like... The, it, it, within international football, the majority of people, bar the country that you're in, will buy shirts because they look nice. They look at the shirt and they think, I like that shirt. They're not necessarily doing it because they support the country. Um, I think you look at um, Nigeria's kit in the last uh, World Cup. Unbelievable. I wanted to buy that kit. Yeah, me too. Yep. Do you know what I mean? Yep. It was unbelievable. Um, you know, there have been some really nice kits. Brazil always has nice kits. And I don't think he should feel any way about wearing that kit. Um, I kind of get I kind of get where he's coming from a bit. But at the end of the day, it's a piece of clothing. And if you like the way it looks and you're comfortable wearing it, then go for it. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, it's one of them, like I say, this is like, like Nosey said, it's a piece of clothing that he's probably gone and worked hard for to earn his money to buy what he wants to buy. Who am I? Who who are we to say 
you can't wear that, you can't buy that. I think I think what happens is like you're talking about um, colonialism and stuff like that. It's it's very very deep. You know, it's you you you've seen a product, you like it. In my mind, I see the product, I like it, I buy it. I don't go that deep into it. You know, and I I think he. I personally think he'll be fine wearing the, um, the the shirt or the kit, the whole kit. You know, he might be somebody that travels and likes going yeah. to different countries and yeah. seeing different cultures. Amazing, you know. So I don't think he should be. I don't think he should be defined by the shirt that he wears. Yeah, I'd say it's it's good that he's sort of been self-aware to to bring up some of these issues. But uh, yeah, really, at the, at the end of the day, it's it's a shirt, and if if. He, if he gets called out on that ever from someone in the street, it sounds like he's already sort of starting to think about the issues which he could then, you know, continue that conversation with people at, on his travels in the street in Peckham, wherever it may be. Um, worth saying too that obviously we've got a few connections to Sierra Leone, uh, Dulwich mm-hmm. Hamlet, um, with Junior Caddy's kind of involvement with the Football mm-hmm. Federation over there over the years. You guys might be better informed on that than me. Mm-hmm. Um, Amber as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Thanks for your clear answers, guys. I mean, I, I, I think, yeah, I probably thought the same as well, but it's, it's uh, reassuring to hear that everyone's kind of on the same page. I've got a Kenya kit. Um, mm-hmm. It's really nice. It's like green. It's got like dark green stars around the collar. Um, so I'll, I'll wear that with pride next time. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. It's, it's, it's not something you should, you know, it's not something you should, it's a piece of clothing. Yes, it has got a symbol on it and it, it is of another country, but, you know, I've had shirts. I used to play for Derby County and wear a forest shirt. You know, a lot of people would have given me abuse for that and I got abuse for that, you know, and I'm from Nottingham, but played for Derby but because of what I was wearing. You know, it's, it's, it's my choice. If I want to wear that, I will wear that, you know. Mm-hmm. So, and if there is any, any repercussions to that, well, in that situation, let's educate each other. Let's not, mm-hmm. you just give me the tyrant of, all the abuse and not listen to my side, you know? So sometimes it's, it's education there and then on the spot. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, I've got a, a second one, which I'm, I really want to um, ask, and then I'll pass over to Hugo because he's got a couple which um, I've sent in. But um, this is actually, I'll admit, this is from me. Um, and I've wondered this for a few years, like particularly in the areas that we that hang out in, in London and work and live. And it, to what extent do you, do you guys reckon it's okay for white people to adopt language that is, has origins in the black community? And I'm talking like, I don't know, saying like wagwan or like on fleek or side ting or all of that kind of stuff like that you hear white people adopt and start using in their own conversations. Have you guys got any thoughts on that? Is that okay? Is it not? Um, my thoughts are... <laughs> My thoughts are stuff like if you were to say Wagwan, it's like I'm thinking, oh, you might have connections to Jamaican, uh, to Jamaica. You you might have family members that are Jamaican that would naturally speak like Wagwan, you read away, you said, you know, that type of talk. I personally, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't feel any type of way. I can I potentially see why people may see it a different way and may react differently to it. But I mean, it's. You know, it's not my language to say that you can't speak it. You know, it's just like me going speaking Spanish or French. What do I go there and I try and do it, and then they react to me? Oh no, I've, you know, I'm learning a language. Do you know what I mean? So I'm not saying that's uh, most most words and things are made up from the streets. Do you know what I mean? So like, who who actually owns it? Do you know what I mean? So I would I I wouldn't have any I wouldn't have any problems like that if you were to if if I could see that you was being cocky with it or trying to you know banter with a little bit of a dig then i'll be like excuse me you know would would have to have a conversation that's how a hard person would, would deal with it that's interesting because we, we had um and it makes total sense as well we had someone on uh twitter reply to us on that and said that if you go to any secondary school now in south london you'll get kids of all races using exactly the same language and yep. you know, including all of that language as well. So it's clearly like prevalent at school now, like every, everyone is using the same language basically. Yeah, I've, I've, I've been in um, secondary schools um, covering PE lessons of year 10s and year 11s. And you know, you've had Turkish boys like, yo bro, you know, all, all the, the, the language and all that. And 
They're not saying it in a bad way. That's just, you know, brought up in Hackney around the people that they're brought up with. It's just one of them things. It just happens. And like you say, when it's prevalent in the whole school, it's not just a section or, you know, it's, it's one of them things that you tend to, you know, look at and sort of follow, you know, so it just becomes natural. Yeah. You guys, have you guys got any thoughts on it? Like, like, um, I um, I'm similar with Lionel um, in the sense where, and the guy that you mentioned on Twitter, where being from London, this is this is the language of like, like I said, the streets and kids in the schools. They they speak they speak like that. The only the only the only way that I will have a problem with this, right, or have an issue, is when you feel that people are speaking to you like that because you're black if that makes sense. Mm, yeah, yeah. And I've had that a lot. Not a lot, but I've had it, should I say, where someone will speak a certain way, all of a sudden they, they're speaking with you and their language changes. They might call you, I don't know, what's happening, brother? They might say yeah, something, yeah. something for just, just an, an example. And that's when I find it a little bit, well, you don't need to, you don't need to feel that you have to speak like that towards me for for that reason does yeah. that make sense so, totally understand it yeah so if you're someone that has maybe not necessarily been brought up in it and you speak like that but if if that's the language you've ad adopted and that's the type of slang you use anyway on a daily basis and whatever then fine but i do find that sometimes people will tweak or change their language to speak mm. to, to to black people if mm. that makes you, sense you, yeah I've, I've, I've been in situations where i felt that as well i probably should have brought that up it feels forced, that you doesn't touch, it? Like, it, yeah it feels like oh wait, there's there's a black guy oh what are you saying bro uh, yeah, oh, yeah. About? I've just met you how are you nice yeah. to meet you oh, my name's Lionel nice to meet you what do you do you know that's that's a conversation the route that you'd want to go down um rather than you know just having the oh well I'm assuming that you speak like this so that's what I'm going to do you know you should never, never assume that how people are because I could be the most well-spoken person before you've even yeah. spoken to me and you're coming to me with, are oh, you right, bro? What you're saying, you know, all the rest. So, yeah. Just I think in terms of a, a black and white answer, I don't think it's a problem, to, 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 mm -hmm. to be honest. I, don't, I wouldn't say it's a problem and I wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anyone to change the way they speak because of who they are. But if that's, who, if that's you, then, then, then go for it. But for me, it just becomes an issue when I feel that people are just changing it for, for yeah. that reason. I understand that. Yeah. And this is, and this is good as well, because we're, we're having the conversation. It's like yeah. me and Mills have just had that conversation there where he said that. And in my mind, it's like, I've been in that situation. I've seen it, but you know, it's one of them things that you have to talk about. And this is why it's, this is the platform to do it. I've just remembered actually um, that I think the reason why I ended up putting this question down was because I work in hospitality and a few months ago I had a customer come up to me who is really well spoken and white guy and he, he came up to me for his like morning drink and he said um well go on brother and mm -hmm. it, it really like jarred me and I and I didn't yeah. really know why and, and I hadn't I couldn't really process <clears throat> why it annoyed me like did I think that, like, was I annoyed at him for adopting someone else's way of speaking? Or was it made even worse? Because I know that he is from a very privileged white background, and yet he's adopting the language of someone who is really isn't. It, mm -hmm. it, it still doesn't really sit very well with me. Um, and so I, I don't think, I wasn't, I wasn't really happy with him using that. But again, it's not, it's not up to me to decide. Uh, I think it's, you know, it's people's per personal preference, I think. But, you know, like you said, I, I, I just don't think people should feel that they have to change or adapt just to maybe fit in with people or to be cool or things like that. You just got to be natural, just be who you are. And if people can't accept you for who you, who you are, then maybe they're just not for you. Do you know what I mean? Uh, it's quite a, an old cliche saying, but maybe they're just not, not, not for you. Um, if you're around a circle of friends and... Uh, you know, th that's the way you speak. That's the way you speak. But like I said, I wouldn't, uh, sometimes I feel that in certain situations, it can be a bit forced and it then becomes a bit uncomfortable, especially for a yeah. black person. You're thinking, mm, 
So do you want me now to, do you expect me to speak like that? Yeah. yeah. Why do you expect me to speak like that? Where yeah. have you seen people speak like that? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. it's, then it all, then it, then it goes even deeper where you're kind of tarring everyone with the same brush. And it's when yeah. you're, when you look at say a black person on the street, you think, well, they, they have, they must speak like that because that's what I see on friends yeah. or TV or this and that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that makes total sense. Hugo, have you got anything that you wanted to mention that we got through? <clears throat> yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Um, one, one of my own and also one that someone sent me this afternoon. Um, just on that last point, I think you both raised something really interesting is that the sort of amazing thing about language is that it is organic and that it does kind of grow out of the way that people speak to each other on the street or in their own communities and stuff. And obviously... Britain is a multicultural country and the language that we speak today is a product of all of those different communities kind of blending and talking to each other and sort of developing over the years. So, yeah, I think the sort of bottom line, as you've both said, is that <clears throat> if it's not forced, it's kind of okay. Um, mm -hmm. Like yeah. if it comes naturally to speak that way, then fine. But it's sort of, if people are kind of changing the way that they speak to speak to you in certain situations, yeah, I can see why that would be a bit, sort of make, make you feel uncomfortable. Yeah, I've got a prime example of someone in our team like that, yeah, that it's just natural. And uh, Jack Connors, JC. JC mm. has been mm. brought up in London yeah. and has been around that culture. That's his natural language. That's how he mm. speaks. And from and I've known JC for for a, for a long time now. Obviously, from uh, when we was at Ebb Street, and that, and that, that's the way he speaks. And it's it's that's he's, he's from London. He's from uh, London. He's been brought up with that, and and that's how he is. I, when when you speak to JC, it's it's not forced. It's no. not. He's put. I've had so many in depth conversations with him about various yeah. things to do with work, football, uh, after football, this that courses, the rest, and. It is just natural. It's not over the top. It's not, mm. oh, I'm trying it. It is just natural. That's how he is. That's how he speaks. So I, I'm like, right, cool. That's you. You know, that's how you speak. Brilliant. He doesn't change it and go and speak to Mills and be like, oh, hi, Mills. Are you okay? He, you know, he's the same with everybody. You know, yeah. so like, like Mills is saying, don't change for anyone. Just be you. And that is a prime mm. example of it. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've I've interviewed Jack, and I know that he speaks the same way as he does in an interview as he does when he's speaking to his teammates. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. natural, natural guy. Um, so I've got a question here from a guy called Charlie. He's a long time listener of the podcast, um, and he says, "I'm intrigued to get thoughts firstly on how the conversation is sustained and how we avoid it just being a preseason discussion that will pass." So obviously we've been having a lot of chats in the last few weeks um, and that's great, but how do we keep that going? And when football starts back up again, how do we kind of keep them this sort of momentum? Um, I mean, like you're saying there, so it's a massive one saying that and talking about the preseason, it's not, it's basically just a fad, right? We have to do this. Let's speak about it. It's done. You know, I've been in, I've been in uh, teams where we've been sitting there, and the person that's speaking is a black man and we've got black players and we've got white players. Uh, we've got foreign players. And it's like, I think it's the conversation when you're having, when the conversation comes up, because that person, that speaker is being so real about his experiences and things that he's seen and, and what he's supposed to talk about. I think people, they do just see it as a preseason. We have to do this because it's, it's, it has to be done. We're sitting there for an hour and then we go and it's whatever. You know, I've sat there and I've felt, as this person's speaking, I felt uncomfortable myself, but I know other people have felt uncomfortable. And it's always the point of something bad has to happen for something to happen. You know what I mean? And <clears throat> a lot of people don't like talking about races and cultures and everything else because they feel they might come across as racist. Like, why? Because we're talking about something. Like I'm one of these, I will sit down with anybody and have a conversation about race. It's not a problem because we're conversating, we're educating each other. I don't know all the, the answers and I'm still learning myself, but I can give you some and you can give me some, you know? So it's a conversation that needs to be, you know, took on much longer, a lot more education, especially when it comes to going into clubs and stuff, because we as role models, every single person in that club that 
at playing at football or any sport are role models, whether they're black, white, you know, Bengali, Pakistani, they are role models, you know. So I think a lot of people need to probably not worry about the conversation that they could potentially have with someone. I think they should just be open and speak and about the situation, you know, about the, the different racist cultures and everything else that goes along with it. Yeah, um, I, I agree with I agree with Lionel, and, and and I also think that for us as sort of of black people, um, this is a part of our lives. So there's no there's no time off if that makes sense. This yeah. is this this is an everyday thing, and I think that in order to keep it going, people need to kind of adopt it in their lives and kind of make it a part of your lives to. You know, we, 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 we talk about equality a lot, don't we? We talk about having equality a lot. And unfortunately, it's an ongoing battle day in and day out. Um, and I think that through, through this platform, I'd like to think that we're going to give people a lot of education tools, which they can then go out and help, help educate themselves. You know, we can't, you know, you can't necessarily do everything for people. You have to then trust people to go out into the real world and adopt what we're doing what we're, what we're saying or, or mm -hmm. at least heeding some of the advice you know we could do seven eight nine ten shows not you know not not every single person that listens is gonna is gonna take mm -hmm. the, the same thing um but what i what, what i do think is it's up to those individuals now to say right i've listened to the information on a platform which i'm familiar with now what now what now what can i do i've <laughs> you know, I've been told about education, right? How am I going to educate myself? Mm -hmm. What shows can I watch? What books can I read? Yeah. Now I'm going to take it out into the world and say, right, this is how I'm going to keep this going and, and, and affect change. I'm really glad you said that because I think, it's, I think the way that this is taken forward and the way that momentum is kept is that people have to take responsibility to make room in their daily lives to continue the conversation. Like it has to almost become a hobby. Like you, you yeah you actually want to contribute to this and actually keep it going rather than it just being a fad like you guys have, have said yeah you need to make space in your life to watch something like every evening or to make sure you read a book a week or like and just keep engaged with it because there's no point relying on someone else to take it forward and then you think yeah. you can kind of contribute or you can like dip in yeah it has yeah. to be like people have to take responsibility definitely and you have to fully immerse yourself into it it's quite easy to look the other way or bury your head in the sand. But these problems at, at this very moment in time are not going away. Clearly, they're not going away. And they're not going to go away unless everyone educates themselves and, and, tries, to, and tries to help. Everyone needs to, to be at the forefront here. It can't just be black people at the forefront. It needs to be everyone against, against racism. There will be people who, you know, there'll be loads of people who won't make that sacrifice, who won't give their time over to to keeping this going, who will post something on social media and say they're supporting BLM or say that they're supporting greater equality or you know supporting anti-racism stuff in football or whatever, but they they won't actually do it. And and so, what what would you what would you say to them, the, the people who won't who aren't interested in taking responsibility and who are just kind of willing to let someone else do it? I think, I think in that situation, you never know who is willing to do something and who is not, especially if they're behind a computer screen writing um, a message out on Twitter, Instagram or whatever, they're behind a computer screen. Like, so they can say that, but how, how do we as, as people make people do something? Do you know what I mean? Like, it's easy to write messages and leave pictures and this and that in, in what you believe in, but like, if you're not willing to do something from the other side of this computer, like, i.e. going out of that door and going to a library, like Mills has said, and reading a book or asking questions, you know, try and just try and get the, get the basis of what is that what people are trying to say, you know, why is this happening? Right. This is happening because of this person and this person, but it's not just that it goes back years and years and years. So I think it's just trying to somehow the people that are putting out yet, yeah, uh, Black Lives Matter pictures and and that's it. It's somehow trying to get hold of them and you know telling them to go on that journey of why don't you find out if you're for why don't you find out why this happens or what you know what happens and when this happened. Thank you guys. Yeah, I think that's a 
that's a really constructive answer about how we can sort of keep this going. Um, my question uh, sort of relates to, to both of you specifically. Um, you both mentioned uh, the, the coaching qualification that you did. And Mosey, am I right in saying that Aaron McLean was on that as well? Yeah, yep. yeah, Mac was on yep. it as well, yeah. Yeah, um, and this week um, the FA and the PFA were kind of putting out some, some uh, information that they're going to try and launch sort of new initiative to try and address the fact that there are limited opportunities for black um, Asian coaches in the game. Um, I was just wondering, from your point of view, obviously you've, you've done this qualification now, and do you see do you see that there are limited opportunities? And if if there are, how do, how do we sort of go go about countering that? Um, there's on our course line, there was a lot of <coughs> of black. Um, yeah, there's a lot of black there was, players there was a good, on, on the there was course. A good mix. Yeah, it was a good mix. Yeah, good mix yeah. yeah, it wasn't more of one race than the other. It was like a good mix, you know, which was really good. Um, so yeah, sorry, mate. No, yeah, it was a good mix. It was a good balance, to be fair, um, which was which was really good. And you kind of come away from it, and you think, well, I came away from it, and I think if this is just one course, at one point of the year, they maybe do two or three a year, um, and that's just the PFA one. There's obviously the FA ones that they run as well, so. Coaches are going on these courses. I don't actually think that's the problem. I think coaches, uh, you know, black coaches, Asian minority, like everyone, like people go on these, on these courses. People have the qualifications. Now, the next step, like you were saying, is so where's, when's the, where's the opportunity going to come? How is the opportunity going to come? Mm -hmm. And clearly, you know, the stats and the, the data shows that there is a problem. There aren't enough, <clears throat> you know, black, you know, Asian minorities. In, in, in the game and how do you combat that? Well, it's a difficult one because mm. in football, as you know, Lionel will know, everyone looks after their mates. So, you know, it's that, it's that culture where, say Lionel was played, with a, played under a manager or with a player that gets a job and Lionel might get the opportunity because he's his mate. Yeah. Um, now, in terms of getting into it, it's a difficult one because I look at it where I don't want to just be given the job because I'm black. I want to be given the job because I'm good enough. That's, that's exactly what I was going to say. And, I, and I've yeah. said the, um, I said it in, I think in my, in my show where I don't want, you, you don't want to be, <clears throat> you don't want to be seen, be see people to see color. You want people to see the individual. Is he good enough for the job? Can he, can he do a good enough job? Unfortunately, there's obviously a lot of biases out there where, at the moment, you are, you have black managers not even getting in the door, not even getting an interview. They might get an interview. They might not go f f further. And um, I think it's the topic on on the PFA, the FA's mind. Like how how are they gonna how are they gonna do it? And to to, to be honest, it's it's it's, re it's a really tough question. It's a really tough yeah. question. I know they've spoken about the Rooney Rule and things like that, but it's a really it's a really tough one. I, I think um, I'm with you there. It's like you say, if you've got a friend that, you know, everybody's got a friend that can, can help them out, that's how you get in the door. And sometimes that's what's needed. Like, because once you're in the door, what are you showing that is good enough for people around you <clears throat> upstairs? You know, the people that own certain businesses and stuff, what are you showing that says to them, actually, you know, rather than not just colour, what you can do? Because I've never, I've always thought about football coach. I've seen so many coaches and, you know, the Sol Campbell situation with the when you look at Gerard and Lampard, it's like how does one and two get to where they are now in a short space of time? And this man has been working. Like I personally got off the view that if you're good enough, just like I used to get told, I'm small. Do you know what I mean? I'm small. I'm five foot seven, and people say, "Oh yeah, but he's small. Yeah, but I'm good enough." And that's what an academy director told me. Like if you're good enough, if you're good enough, you're big enough. You no, know, so if you're good enough at your job, then I'm gonna choose you because you're the best regardless of whatever color or race you are and i think it's with the with the rules the ruling rules and everything that they're bringing out now it's it's easy to go and interview 10 black uh coaches or asian uh, minority ethnicities and three white people and just go right well we've done 10 so we've filled mm. our quota that's cool we're going with x over here do you know what i mean so how it's, it's one of the like I say it's a tough question 
Mm. How do we get around this? Because it's just honest chats. It might be people upstairs go, I just don't want you working for me. Or it might just be what you've come to me with, it's not what we're looking for. Or do you know what I mean? Rather than mm. the color of your skin, mm. you know, so, or, or your religious beliefs. You know, I think you should, do, I think they should base it off. Can you do the job? Yes, you can. Go and get me to the premiership. That's what I want, regardless of what you look like. I'm glad we, um, I'm glad we, we are talking about the Rooney rule because at the moment I'm reading um, while I'm no longer talking to white people about race by um, Rennie Addo Lodge. Which is, it's, it's really uh, interesting. It's an incredibly insightful book on the history of race in the UK. And she talks about the Rooney rule um, quite extensively and how it has actually had a massive impact in the States in NFL mm -hmm. because they, um, because um, I, I'm not like au fait with NFL, I might get some of the terminology wrong, but I, what I've read is that whereas previously they wouldn't have interviewed any black candidates, mm -hmm. they were making sure that they inter 10 out, out of 10 candidates, five were black. And Millsy, you were saying that, you know, I don't want to be hired or chosen because I'm black to fill a quota. I want to be chosen with mm -hmm. them. So they would interview these five black candidates who they wouldn't have even like, included. Oh, yeah. And actually, they realized that these guys were brilliant at what they do and had the skills needed to nail the job. And so they started seeing, you know, they started giving the time to these black candidates. And before you know it, the NFL was awash with black coaches who were making mm -hmm. it less of yeah. what they were doing. And I think the reason why that's not taken off here, maybe, is that I think maybe, like, because just geographically, we're in such a small, like quite a close environment in the UK that like you guys say, like everyone knows everyone. So there's like an old manager's club, right? And they all yeah. know right? everyone gets a recommendation. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Frankie Lampard's doing his coaching badges, get him in the door, will you? Yeah. Whereas yeah. in the NFL, maybe, maybe geography plays a big part in that there isn't that same yeah. like close knit club. So yeah. Yeah. something like the Rooney rule, and clubs in totally different areas of the country will think, okay, yeah, let's do it. There's no one in their ear saying, oh, I'll give my nephew a go, will you? Mm -hmm. So I think maybe that's a, a problem that's specific to the UK and why the Rooney Rule hasn't taken off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, th I think it's a good they... example. Like you said, you know, they've, they've, they've given them an opportunity and because they've got their foot in the door. And that's, that's one of the hardest things is getting your foot in the door, let alone getting the job. Mm -hmm. You just need to sit down in front of a board. That's the yeah. hardest thing. And you know, once you can get that opportunity, then it should be down to the candidate if they're good enough. But clearly there is a problem. Clearly there is a problem. And, and even, even if the candidate is getting interviewed, they're still not getting the jobs. And whether that's because they're not good enough, whether the board are looking at them thinking, mm, not sure, you, you know, we, no one's going to point blank come out and say it. Mm -hmm. um, so, look, I, I mean, I hope, I hope it changes. Like I said, there's, there's enough black asian and, and ethnic minorities going on the courses that's mm -hmm. a fact i've seen it me and line i've seen it for our in a, with our own two up to eyes so there's not a i wouldn't say there's a lack of coaches mm -hmm. uh, going through the qualifications um but yeah like you said i think in this country it's uh it's who you know and who's mm -hmm. whose uncle is on that board and who's <clears throat> whose granddad done this and done that and again you're going to, you know you're stepping into another realm there's no black people on boards. Rick, there's, there's, you've got what Les Ferdinand yeah. at, at QPR, and that's 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 pretty much it. So, um, like, hope, I want there to be change. I think, you know, we just got to keep fighting for it. And what the PFA, you know, they're coming up with different initiatives um, to obviously get people in in the door. And you know, you just need to get that opportunity. That's all this. That's all it's about, really. Is can I can I get an opportunity to show what I can do? If I'm not good enough, fair enough. I'm just not good enough. That's it. You, you hold your hands up if you go in somewhere and you set out your presentation and you know it's not gone well and they will, you know, they give you, oh, we'll give you the call. You don't get the call. Is what it is. You learn from that experience, regardless of your race. You learn, what did I not do? What did I not prepare? Because obviously something wasn't good enough, hence why somebody else got the job, you know? So, like I said, I just don't want it to be, right, like you say, five white people and five black people in the NFL. I don't want it to be right. Well, we'll get we'll get Lionel, we'll get Millsy in, and then we'll get you know because it it fills a quota. 
So how do you think we go? How do you think they could go forward on that? Like how do how do they improve it? Because we can sit here and say, you know, we hope it changes, and that mm -hmm. the coaches are going into the system and they've got the skills to do it. But then there's a brick wall. So what 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 do you think needs to happen? Like, does it need to be like systemic change from the FA, or can like a a club board just make it a priority to implement the Rooney really, really rule themselves, even though it's not actually a directive? Yeah, that, that, that's it as well. I mean, like, because the FA is saying we're going to bring in this rule and the PFA is saying we're going to bring in this rule, now there's pressure put on this chairman that's put in 50 million over the last five years of his money trying to get the club somewhere that he might, he might not be thinking about a race. He's just thinking about getting the job done. So can you have one organisation telling another organisation what to do? Like, it's, it's tough. I think... I think the door from, from the point of view of people owning clubs and you know, pumping in their money and that, I think it just needs to be left ajar for um, BAME coaches and managers to just tr try and get through the door. You know, because there's been so many situations where, like I say, the Sol Campbell one for me is, is just mind blowing how he worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. And then, unfortunately, the last two jobs he's had because of you know, financial problems there and financial now financial problems because of COVID-19 hasn't worked out. But like, I look at his route and think, what will he do now? Where will his opportunity be? And realistically, I should be thinking about myself. You know, I'm 32 years old. I'm a coach. I still want to play. But if I have to go into a coaching role and stuff, I'm, I'm like, I wrote a list down of clubs that I can ring up. You know, Dulwich is still on there, you know, to give them a call to see, will you let me through the door? I sent two. I sent one to the conference, one to League One. Will you let me through the door? I know these people personally. Like Millsy says, sometimes you know someone, they could do you a favour. They could not. So all, all you're asking for is the opportunity, the, the, the door being ajar just a little bit. Yeah, it's, um, I guess that's all, that's all you can really hope for. I think the, I think the interesting one would be Ashley Cole because I, I get the feeling like he's doing some really good things with the Chelsea like under-16s or something. So maybe that's going to be the next one that you keep an eye on and you wonder whether or not he's going to get a chance because if he's going to nail it with the under-16s and then all of a sudden the door's blocked, like, is he going to have to do what Sol Campbell did and like, drop down to League Two or something? Whereas, you know, Stephen Gerrard can do, I don't know, 18 months in the Liverpool Academy and then walk in at Ibrox. And, and, and that's the problem. I mean, I don't, I don't think it's... I mean, if, if Ashley Cole was to go from under-16s to a first team, I'd be questioning that. I'd be going, what's happening here then? I'm coaching under 10s and on a Wednesday and under 9s on a Saturday, so surely I can get in at the conference. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's, and like I say, with Lampard and Gerrard, that situation there is, yes, Lampard, uh, Gerrard working with the 18s at Liverpool. Yes, we know who he is, and he gets one of the biggest jobs in the country, you know, that has got a history of, you know, being at the top, you know. Um, and Lampard goes to, I'm not sure what he was doing, uh, after he retired, but goes to Chelsea for, uh, goes to Derby for under a year, you know, makes the playoffs. Yeah, brilliant. Is is that enough? Is that enough of a base to go right now? You're the manager of um, Chelsea, or is it you're right, Abramovich? Yeah, I'm I'm a, I'm a manager. You know, played for you. I've done for you. I've won this and that. Let's yeah. what's happening? You know, and then that that takes another friend in Lampard, Jody Morris, and so on. You know. Yeah. Um... I wanted to, before we like, finish up in like, I don't know, 20 minutes or something, I know I wanted to, and we all were actually quite interested in, in speaking to you about um, your experiences of being um, part of a family where there are two, two, two races, mixed race family. Mm -hmm. like, if you, I've, I've, I've read a few things on this over the last few weeks on that there are like, specific like, difficulties growing up in a, in a mixed race household. And do, I wanted to, like, if you're happy to speak, speak about it, I think we were just quite interested to know, like, how, like, how aware of it were you when you were growing up? And, like, did it cause, like, different difficulties when you were growing up than it would if you were from a, a single-race family? Or, you know, did it lead to any problems at school? Or, like, what was your experience of it? Like, and, and even now, to be honest. Yeah, um, my experience, really, was uh, my mom, who's white, uh, dad, who's black. Um, my dad wasn't around. And, I, you know, it's not unfair to say that he wasn't around. Um, and I don't, I mean, I was one of them kids that never wanted for anything. So I never used to worry about asking for things, whereas my brother and sister would get. Uh, but I, it, it, 
it must have, I think it affected me in some ways, like knowing that I was different. Like I looked at my mom, my mom's white and I'm brown. Why is this? Do you know what I mean? And then it's not until I got a little bit older that I felt like people were looking at me differently. You know, I, I witnessed my walking down the street with my mom, come back from the doctor, I think it was, and uh, someone shouting out over the road, you know, you end lover. Like, because she's holding my hand. Do you know what I mean? And I'm, I must have been about eight or nine, you know, and then it, it, it's like, what, what happened there, mom? Like, and obviously she's not explaining it. So she's not, maybe she should have told me at that point that this is something that happens, you know, because I, and then I would be in situations where I'd go to school and in my school in Nottingham, multicultural, no problems at all. Uh, I went to school in Derby and I noticed that a lot of people looked at me so differently. And I thought, because I was playing for Derby at the time, I thought it was because of that. But it wasn't. It was because I was one of five, one of four black people in the whole school. And there was one um, Asian girl. And I could, see, I could see and I could feel. And I had comments made about the colour of my skin. And, you know, not, not on a daily basis, but it would happen. And it, would, it's, it's that, it affected me in school times, like that time, definitely. Um, where it's something that I didn't think I'd have to deal with. I just thought I was going to a school, new school, playing for Derby County, brilliant. But then I see the area as I grew up that I was living in, in that specific uh, town, that it was different and I was different. You know, you, you, you walk in, like Mills said, you walk into a shop and you looked at differently. The security guards following you around. Why? <laughs> you know, I've been, I've, I was paid £100 at 14 years old a week to play, for, do you know what I mean? So it's, I've got the money to do. I know you don't know that, but why are you following me around the shop? Why are you looking at me in this type of way? Like, I don't, I don't like that. You know, um, I remember when I signed for Watford and it was my biggest, biggest, like, payday. Um, <clears throat> and I went into a shop. I never used to carry a bank card because I was like, no, just in case it gets declined or whatever. And I've gone into a shop and I walked in the shop and I've seen the way the man has looked at me. Like, I'm, I'm wearing all black. I've walked in, it's like, you can buy Ralph Lorenz and stuff like that. And the way the man looked at me affected me within five or 10 seconds that I knew he was looking at me. And it's for some reason I felt him thinking, what am I doing in the shop? Why are you in the shop? You know? And I'm like, I shouldn't be feeling this, but my reaction to it was right. I'll buy 10 of these. I love that, 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 just to show you that you can't affect me, you know, in, in, in hindsight, like it's probably, you know, I won't do it now. Let's put it that way. Um, but I just did it, and I, I, but I just felt the way that I was received from walking in the shop within 10 seconds, you know, and I, I do believe I felt it was about the color of my skin. You know, um, there's, there's so many, there's a situation where I've been pulled over by the police for no reason. I've been out of my car, walking in my house, the police have pulled up saying we're pulling you over. Why? Because I've got a nice car. Like, I've worked for my nice car. Like, but they're looking at, oh, looks like a young boy, mixed race, what, what's he doing to get that? You know, mm. asking me questions. Why am I being made to feel any type of way when I'm running around doing what I'm doing, earning my money? You know, so there's, there's, there's situations where it has affected me. Probably as I've got older, I've got wiser and I look at things in a different way because back in the day, I'd be, I'd be quick to bam. I, you say something, bam, we're going, it's off. You know what I mean? Whether I'm giving you abuse back or we're scrapping. You know what I mean? That's how I would be. Um, but now as I've got older and wiser, I've got my little girl that I've got to educate along the way um, and make her know about every type of race, people, everything, you know. So that effect from what I've the effects I've had in my life, I will now give my daughter the best education I can going forward regarding races and cultures and, you know, um, little people, disabled people, mental health, physical, you know, everything. You know what, Lan? I've been really interested in this particular show. Just the mm. fact that you know you're, you obviously come from a mixed race background, and obviously, as you know, my wife is mixed race as well. Yeah. So you know, I've I've heard many. You know, she's told me different stories and and how mm. she's been made to feel mainly at a younger age. Yeah. I had a I had a question about identity. So you grew up with your mum, who's obviously white, like you said. Um, did you have much contact with the, your dad's side of the family? Um, and if not, 
how are you kind how do, how did you kind of identify yourself as you know because there's always these questions with mixed race and, and my wife has had it oh do you see yourself more as black do you see yourself more as white do you, this and that this and that but i'd just be really interested to see how you feel growing up uh, obviously predominantly with your mum and and were you made to feel that you had to pick a side were you made to feel that you know you're, you're either with this or that mm-hmm. um no well obviously father not being around it was never it was never i thought i was more black than white mm. i just used to say i'm brown i'm mixed race mm. that's, a, that's the color i am i'm brown <laughs> that's what it is um maybe not never never on my mom's side would i ever like she would she be like all right well your your he are your dad isn't he are he doesn't care the family doesn't care da, da, da. it was like sometimes on the black side of my family it would be like I sort of felt that that way like you are like i've got my mom's last name i haven't got my dad's last name but all my family on my dad's side are like no you're you're a staff you're a staff you're a staff and i'm like are you trying to put that in my head to say that i am more of you than i am my mom you know because of disagreements and whatever like and it's just it was never it's never one that it was put in my head or anything to feel like i was one more than the other mm-hmm. and i just always used to say to myself I am a brown man. I'm a brown boy. I'm a brown kid. Like, that's me. I'm half mm. black. I'm half white. I don't side with, right, my dad wasn't there, so I'm going to be more white on my mom's side. I, I chose my path in that situation to go, I'm a brown man, mom's white, dad's black. And that's, there's nothing I can do about that. I was brought into the world. Now I'm going to go and if I can potentially educate someone along the way, brilliant. I hope I don't have to. You, you, you never want to come into them situations where, you might or be in a situation where someone else is receiving abuse where you might have to educate someone um because a lot of people don't like to listen so i just took it upon myself to be be me you know rather than yep i'm more my dad's i'm more my mom's you know no i know you um you said you were very sort of passionate about the, the black lives matter movement and and everything that's been sort of going on in the world and you just speak about kind of your your views on it and um sort of what how do you do you feel that there's a there's a positive energy that there's going to be changed from it yeah it's it's a great movement um it's like i was saying at the start of the whole interview it's it's sad because something bad has to happen for something to change it's mm-hmm. like sometimes when you you've you've not seen your family for a long while and it's a funeral that brings you back together because of someone's past in the family why does it have to be that um mm-hmm. the situation is before it all blew up, I see on social media, so I see something out there and I see the situation and I looked at it and I'm like, this is shocking. This is unbelievable. What is happening? You've got people in the background saying, take your knee off his neck, take your knee off his neck. And there's four people, four officers there that no one's listening. You know, when just seeing that was shocking. The next day it went bam. And I was like, wow. Okay. So what I saw was because of this, because of what happened with this person and I see a a clip of his daughter, I think he's on his uh, brother's shoulders and she, I get emotional now I think about it. (laughs) She, uh, she was on his shoulders and she said, dad has changed the world. You know how powerful that is? And Mm. it's sad because that little girl has had to go through that as much as her dad has. Mm. And now she's got to grow up without her dad and face these challenges so i hope for her that it is something amazing for him and his family to move forward and this black lives matter movement you know doesn't stop it can't stop until the education is there for everybody you know to to be able to live freely Mm. just to live freely that's brilliant man it's brilliant brilliant and i suppose you obviously you know, you're a father yourself and I suppose that's why you have more of a personal connection to what has happened. You've got a daughter as well. Yeah. And um, I can I can see how, why and how you can get so so emotional with it. And I think just, just seeing you now is, this is all the emotion that, that is yeah. coming from everyone. Mm-hmm. This, is the, this is the emotion that's coming from everyone and, and all the fathers out there with daughters and sons and, and you know, and, and, and black, you know, black, white, Age, like it, every, it, it's brought everyone together and it's really connected everyone. And um, now I'm, I'm, I'm so happy that you was able to share that. And 
it's it's yeah. one of them it's i i understand people don't, i don't like violence myself but i understand there's there's a process of things that happened back in the day to black people sold as slaves you know um oppressed and i know everything the marches that are going on the peaceful marches and that brilliant because that brings around education that makes people watch listen take note when it starts to get violent i understand the violence because of everything that has happened back then so i get it that black people was oppressed some of the videos i've seen in historical things is shocking shouldn't happen to anybody and this is why the generation now that grow up in in the cities and areas that they do have the violence because it happened then you can't expect something that happened bad then to change now you know someone's lost their life and what we should just go okay that that officer gets put in prison and that's it people are gonna they have that narrative of right well that's what happened then so this is what we're going to do now like i said i don't condone violence at all but the, the the peaceful marches and stuff like that that i've seen and i would have loved to have been a part a, a part of if i wasn't in a household that was vulnerable through covid19 um i just think peaceful protests and getting your point of view uh, point of view across and trying to understand it and even myself trying to understand more things i just hope it goes such a a, a long way i think just on that um on the violence thing as well, it's, it's been proven throughout history that if if someone isn't heard and they keep repeating themselves again and again and again, and every time they're not heard, they will resort to violence. Like whether yeah. it's one person, whether it's a million people, if they don't feel like they're heard, eventually it gets to a point where the only way of getting yourself heard is to resort to violence to make a point. And yeah. when I was seeing on Twitter, like people saying, this isn't going to help the movement, this isn't doing any good, and you know, getting cut down for it like when they were writing in the states i was like, like what do you expect me to, to do at yeah. this point um and yeah the, the peaceful protests i've been to quite a few in london like some local ones around here like burgess park and, and peckham ryan and some up in central as well and the key thing about them is you know people say as well that they don't they don't really have an impact but they do because they raise awareness so, so like someone sat at home will see that being covered on bbc news like no matter how it's being reported yeah. like, by the press they will still see that footage and, and probably engage with the subject and actually realize that something's happening i think more than anything just those pieces of protests are more useful just for raising awareness and also what's been really interesting at those protests as well is how much of a cross race like mix yeah. there's been like maybe not so much cross class which is probably an issue in itself you know it's been people um from majority of the, the same class really but in terms of cross race, you're like it's been amazing to see the different faces. Right, yeah. in the protest, whereas before, you probably wouldn't have seen such a mix. Yeah, mm. yeah, definitely. Especially like when the riots were happening, it was more it potentially, from what I remember, probably was more black people. But like mm. you say, now it's you know my mom and my sister went to a march in Nottingham, and my mom's white, and my sister's mixed race. You know what I mean? So even that there is like brilliant. Like my mom didn't mm. have to go along, but she understands it, she gets it, and she did. You know, which was nice to see and it's like she said that it was peaceful um multicultural people out there all going for the same uh you know rooting for the same cause Lionel thank you so much for for sharing that it's no really really powerful um and I think you you sort of raised a really good point that <clears throat> you know it takes these like events in history to spark change and mm -hmm. obviously like we wish that George Floyd didn't have to die in the manner that he did and his yeah. daughter take on that burden Mm -hmm. in the manner that it happened for this mm -hmm. this to carry on i think <clears throat> there's been a bit of a debate in sort of british politics and in in the press this week about whether this is a moment or whether this is a movement and you have yeah. people sort of writing it off as a moment and i think that's so that's so sort of disrespectful to not only to him and his family yeah. but to the millions of people who've taken that on and mm -hmm. trying to carry it forward because it clearly needs to be a movement in order for there to be any change definitely um, Definitely. Yeah, so. I mean, that's, that's one of the things, that, like you say, a movement. So keep that movement going, do it in the safest way possible because we don't want nobody else to come to harm. Um, and, and like you say, just keeping it going. It's, it's, don't just let it, like you say, be a moment, you know, because this is life. This is for the next generation, generations to come. You know, this will be for my kids, 
my kids' kids, you know, uh, when I'm older and I can explain to them that this happened and this is potentially why you're going through this now, but, you know, so it's all, it's like I say, once again, it's all education and I think it has to be a movement. It has to go that way. In terms of um, keeping the momentum, I'm trying to relate it back to Dulwich Hamlet specifically, and it also comes back to this, um, like the, when I say that the protests are like multiracial and a great mix of people, unfortunately the crowd at Dulwich is not. Like that is something which we've been aware of for years and is something which we decided we wanted to speak about in these um, recordings as well. And we've actually had a few people get in touch um, with questions uh, asking us to have a conversation about what can we do to improve that and actually what is what is the root of there not being a good representation of the black and Asian minority communities at football games in general but specifically at Dulwich Hamlet is there a, is there you know a, a one one like um, one thing that means that it is not an environment where those people don't f feel welcome or is it a mix of different things? I, I would I'd just jump in and I'd probably say it's people's choices. You know, it's people like if, if you've got Dulwich and you've got Millwall and you've got, you know, Chelsea, Fulham and all the rest, is, they might be like, right, well, I'm going to the Fulham game this week. That might just be what happens. Um, everybody at the ground might just be local. You know, people might go and do something different on a Saturday. They'll probably love to go, but they got other commitments, you know, regardless of race, you know, like when one thing I've noticed about the Dulwich uh, Hamlet's crowd is the, the brilliant crowd never once thought about, Oh, that's predominantly white or predominantly black. Never, not once, you know, and I think they show their support in coming to watch, especially a team like Dulwich that has got multiple black players and different ethnicities and um, religions, you know, and that, crowd is there to watch them, their team. You know, everyone says, Dulwich, it's, it's our team, it's our club, you know, and you feel that around the area. But um, I, I think it might just be people's choices. So I don't think there's anything there to be like, well, how can we get more black people in to watch? Like, because it might just fall on the day that they do something different, you know? Because a, a Tuesday night could be different to a Saturday afternoon. You could have more black people on a Tuesday night than more white people, you know? So it's, I think it's just one of them potential choices and whether they like the sport you know loads of different sports out there now that people decide to go and watch or decide to pursue I'm just thinking as you were speaking then that um I I, I read up a lot on football in England in the 70s and 80s and you know how rife it was with homophobia racism um, and I can't help but feel that the football environment as it was then would have been the environment that um, like people my age or like slightly younger or slightly older, their parents would have experienced football in, you know, in that period. And it would have been that kind of environment, like not welcoming, um, you know, incredibly um, homophobic, incredibly racist. And so maybe has that been passed down to people our age? In and I mean, in terms of the black community, ethnic minority commu community, like, is that, could that have an effect of why there isn't a good representation? It might, it might not be. I'm just wonder, wondering now as we're talking. I think I'm going to like respectfully not disagree, but I, th I think there must be something because just because of the lack, like there's just because of the lack of black people at games. I think, uh, what, I think there could be an element to what you're saying, Ben, in terms of, that might might be passed down. But I think the generation now, especially in South London, I think a lot of the, you know, especially the, like maybe people like our age, I think if they wanted to go to a game, they, they'd maybe go, they would go to a game. But I think it's about accountability and responsibility. So like I said before, we've identified that there's not many black fans. So what are we going to do about it? What I think you've got to look at it from the outside in and think, right, if I was a, say I was a, I was a black man or woman or Asian man or woman, why would I come to Dulwich Hamlet? What is, what is at Dulwich Hamlet that makes me feel comfortable and inclusive and things like that? Because all they're going to see, potentially all people are going to see is that the whole crowd's white. Let's just say that, potentially. 
but what are, what are, what are, you know what are we as a club doing if we're saying that we want to have have more diversity within within the crowd what are, what are we doing um are we putting on community days at the club are we putting on um you know are we are we doing like uh, something to do with the wind rush at the club you know just just anything it's these initiatives and and schemes that can be hosted at the football club to to attract people and one you know one two three families might come they tell friends they tell friends they tell friends and then it grows i think once they walk in the door obviously the club's brilliant like lionel said the fans are are great but how do we get those people into the door to feel are we putting maybe leaflets through the door to invite people to games are you know what what what, what, what are we doing it's, it's stuff in the community that you have to do you've you can go in your local community you've got local schools you've got local colleges people in the community that want to do and try, want to try and go to different things and do different things. So like Moose was saying there, um, an open day of, you know, come along, have some fun and see what we're about as a club, as a whole, rather than just, you know, it's oh, only white people go there, you know, or only mm. black people go there or only Asian people go there, you know, just, it might need to be a little bit more from the club's point of view um, with regards to players, not just because obviously players have to do things as well because it's their, it's their job to go into the community and raise that awareness that we are actually here and we are welcoming. What if, um, yeah, I get your points, but what, like the club historically has done a lot in the community, like loads. Like, that's one of the reasons why the crowd has grown massively. Like it's been yeah. real now at this point in 2020, the club is right at the center of its community. Like it's an incredible example of what a football club can be in England in 2020 like, at any level. Mm-hmm. So, there have been these drives before, but what if I was to say that we, we've, tr- we've tried to do that, or the club has tried to do that, but attendance from the black community has been so low that it hasn't had any impact? Like, is that then because, that, is that just a representation of the local community? Like where we are in East Dulwich is predominantly white. So is, is, is that mm. the driving factor? And so actually trying to like, and, and that leads me on to another question. Can you actually be specific and say, this, this community drive is for the black community? Mm. Can, you actually, can you actually like implement positive discrimination in a way and say like, look, we want to increase attendance. Like this is for you. I think you have to maybe broaden your horizons a bit. And like you said, a lot of the community stuff has been done in and around Dulwich Hamlet. There's a lot of, there's a lot of surrounding areas of Dulwich, which are not far. You've got, you've got like Brixton, you've got, uh, Peckham, um, you know, you've got all these places which are, which are really close to Dulwich, and I think it's just about widening the scope and saying, well, people are only ten minutes away, five minutes away. We're inviting you to come to the club. Um, so I think it's just about, yeah, just broadening it, really, broadening the radius, seeing Dulwich as bigger than Dulwich, if that makes sense. Um, because, like you said, Dulwich is a is a is a predominantly um, a white area and the fan base does reflect the area of Dulwich but what what can we do in the slightly wider community and uh, um, neighboring communities to 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 help um, bring that attendance up of sort of the black and ethnic minorities and this is what I'm saying about education even myself there I'm from Nottingham I live in East London now I didn't know the demographic of the area so that's me learning something new so that's me thinking now okay well, maybe I can come back to you guys at a different point going, oh, why don't we suggest this? You know, so like Millsy says, sometimes you have to broaden your horizons and go a little bit further out. Yeah. Um, we're, we're about on time, I think, lads. Like, that's been a really interesting chat. and we've, we've run over by about five minutes probably, but it doesn't really matter because I found that really interesting. I'm glad we covered those questions at the beginning because mm-hmm. like, stuff like that is so simple. But the people who mm-hmm. ask those questions... Like us being in a space where we'll be able to answer that for them is so, I hope, so valuable to them. Like it was yeah. valuable to me and I hope that oh, definitely. whoever's listening or, or, or watching this will find it as valuable. Definitely. No, I look, I look forward to watching it myself as well because it's not, I'm passionate about, <clears throat> I'm passionate about things and, you know, it's uh, what you just witnessed from myself and Danny and yourself and Ben it, um, and Hugo, it's, it's passion, you know, it's passion for what we look at and what we're trying to learn and what we're trying to do moving forward. So, you know, hopefully people can take something from it. This is, you know, coming from behind your keyboards to the people that just put up a picture or put up a quote, 
and, and trying to learn, learn more about situations, cultures, you know, diversity in general. Yeah, thank you for joining us today, Lionel. It was a really great chat. And, uh, well, yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. Um, just all, all about keeping it going as we, as we keep discussing. Definitely. Yeah, we've got um, plenty of people booked in as well, so this will just keep rolling and rolling, I'm glad to say. Um, Good. Listen, Danny and Hugo, do you want to stay on the line just for 10 minutes just to catch up because we haven't spoken all week? I'm just yeah. Things that we could probably go over if you've got time. Um, yeah, that's fine. Lionel, cheers, man. Thank you. Really Thank really you. Really cheers, Lionel. Take man. care, mate. Nice Good to see you again. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, and I'll uh, see you all soon, hopefully. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.